My name is Sarah Milligan. I'm with the Oklahoma State University Library, the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program. Um, I'm at the Shalaka Reunion. Um, today's date is June 2nd, 2018. Um, and I'm here talking with Shalaka alumni Billy May. We're going to be talking about his um, time at Shalaka as well as his military service. All right, that's as formal as it gets. Um, so I wanted to ask you first, can you just tell me a little bit about yourself? Where are you, where are you from and maybe a little bit about your family? Uh, I was born down, and like you say, some long lived around that area and, uh, and around Ada until 1942. And when the war started, we moved to Hobart out in the western part of the state. Mm -hmm. And we lived there all during World War II. Let's back up a little bit. And I know you grew up in Oklahoma, but you were telling me that you went through school through your sophomore year. Yeah. And then you dropped out to work. Out. And I worked in a uh, harvest and one day. Yeah, you but, went to California, it sounds uh, but like. I went to California in 46. Okay. And uh, I, got to, I got this job in California working on a what would we'd call a combine back in this country. It was a machine that picked hops off of the vine. You make malt for liquor, beer out of the hops. Right. So that's a job I got lucky, fell into it because I was needed the job. Yeah. So I got that job and of course I went to work for a guy. They they said we need a bunch of help. They said, you, 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 and you, and like 10 people go over to that machine, and they had four of them. You, 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 and you, and I got down, I'm way down the end, I'm sure he pointed at me to go over there. You know, that got me a job. <laughs> you weren't waiting to make sure it was true or not? That's <laughs> right, they cheered, because if anybody got cut out, if there was more help for there, they would trim it down, you know. Yeah. And so I went to work and I helped a guy and I was mechanically inclined enough that I knew what he was talking about to set this machine up. Never seen it before in my life, but I, it was like a combine. Mm -hmm. So I worked with him and then uh, he said, where are you from? And I said, Oklahoma. And he said, oh, me too. He said, I came out here before the war and I worked in the, and for, the, for the Navy at, the, at an air station uh, over by uh, Santa Rosa, California. And he said, after the war's over, then they cut me loose and I had to do things else. So I went to work for an Oklahoma. In California? In California. And then... Are there still a lot of Oklahomans we, out in California at that yeah, point? Yeah, that's California. You know, they used to say that you could find your way from Arkansas to California, but following Baloney Rhines and bread wrappers. Mm -hmm. That's how they got there. It's the cheapest way to get there. That's the only money they had. Yeah. Anyhow, I worked for him for a week on this job. And they said, okay, we're going back to Santa Rosa where they were from. And anybody wants to work for us, put your stuff on the truck and we're gone tomorrow. I was the only guy out of 50, 60 guys that worked there. They were all transits. Yeah. And they followed the, the, the harvest in California. Yeah. So I told my uncle and, uh, and we were living with a, a, an aunt, a sister of his, and I said, I got me a job and I'm going with them and I'll see you back in Oklahoma maybe one of these days. Mm -hmm. So I went with them and when we got there, they had, they had like 40 acres of hops and they had like another 40 or 60 acres of plum trees that they raised. So that was the two items that they harvested the year round. Mm -hmm. And these were brand new machines, the first time they'd ever been put out commercially. So I'm just helping the guys because he had a cookhouse like this mm -hmm. for people that worked for him. They could eat there for practically nothing every meal. They didn't have to go out looking for something to eat when they were working on his property. Right. So 
I worked around the cookhouse up in the guy, and the second day, the father that owned the company is Fred Seymour, and he came in the cookhouse to have lunch, and he said, I was sitting there and talked to him, he said, I hear you're going to go to work done tonight, or tomorrow night. And I said, I don't know, and he said, oh yeah, Fritz told me he's going to put you on tomorrow night. So that meant running two shifts on eight machines around the clock. Oh gosh. He said, we pay $20 a shift, whether it's eight hours or whether it's 20 hours. You go out there, if your machine breaks down, you stay there and work on it. The other man comes to work, he helps, you help him get it going so he can start his shift. So whatever that happens, that's what you will get paid. Mm -hmm. I'm at the, at the end of the week, I'm gonna take your money, I'm gonna put it in the bank for you under your name and my name. When you decide to quit, that's with all the people that work for me. If you decide to quit, we go to the bank, we draw it out, you get your money. This way nobody can steal your money because you're gonna be working day shift or a night shift. Mm. That's, you know, nothing you can do, you're working seven days a week and 24 hours a day sometimes or eight hours or 12 hours or whatever. So I worked there two months, basically one and a half on that job and went to the bank. I had a roll of bills like this. I had like $450 oh. saved. Most money I'd ever seen except in a bank. Yeah. So I had caught a bus and came back to Oklahoma, and that's when I went to school in the sophomore year. Oh, I see. And, and so then that's when you decided. The next year, I called him and he said, Yeah, I'll come back. You got your job. So you so took I off again. I go back in 47, and I worked for him all that summer. And that fall, I needed the job. Well, I got made enough money, I could buy me a car. I could get around from where I lived and so So I got a job with a telephone, Pacific Bell Telephone and the people that made the phone equipment. Mm -hmm. I in, helped install the first dial phones in Santa Rosa, California in 1947. Wow, did you have to know much about tech? The technology? No, the all you had to do is do what they told you to do, and that's unroll thousands of feet of cable to be hooked up to the machinery work that makes it go from a lady setting up your saying, number please, mm -hmm. to a, a dial phone. And I worked there until like, I don't know, May or June. I worked uh, Santa Rosa, South San Francisco, Burlingame, San Mateo, in those offices, mm -hmm. just running, running the cable for the guys that had to know how to hook them up. Yeah. But it's a real job to hook up back in those days right. to hook every wire up where it needs to be. Yeah. And the guy used to tell us, boys, one of these days, this is all of this landline hard lines going to go away. We said, man, you're crazy. Because he was a little bit off anyhow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but he'd say out there, what's the why? He'd say, yep. He said, one of these days, right now, it all goes line line from place to place. One day, they're going to have a tower up here and it's going to be a radio. And it's going from radio tower to radio tower all over the country. And then it may get to be something else. I don't know what they've got planned. Mm -hmm. And you thought, gee, man, I'm 18 years old now, and they tell me this, and I have no idea what he, you know, what he's thinking, what he knows. Yeah. And I said, if I put a dollar away all the time back in those, I'd have been a millionaire mm -hmm. by the time I was 50. Because mm -hmm. everything come true that he ever told us about. Oh my gosh. And then I came back to Oklahoma and then I did what I told you about to the young lady that I met. She was in high school, last two years of high school. And uh, 
then when she got out, she was going to go to college, and I had to do something. She convinced me I ought to go back to school, and, and that's the greatest thing that ever happened to me, is having her convince me I needed to go back and finish my education. Mm -hmm. Didn't work out between her and I for about 60 days, and mm -hmm. she was there and I was here. So tell me again how you decided to come to Shalaka. Well, uh, I said, you know, the only way I have any thing is to go to Shalaka because it's free. I can't afford to go to school, public school, <clears throat> and work and do that. So I. So you would have had to support yourself for the living expenses yeah, of going to public school? I support myself and. I was living with my older brother. Uh, we had an apartment out there, and uh, we had been, he and I both had been there in that area for uh, basically uh, 10 years. Mm. In the, in so, the Hobart area? Yeah. Okay. So then I found out I could come here, and I caught a bus, mm -hmm. and I came, and uh, there was two young ladies on the bus when we got out here to the to get off at the end of the street. They let you out at the They arch. let us out there. If you came on the train, you used to get off at the depot. The passenger train would stop at the depot and let you off. Mm -hmm. But if you are on the bus, you got off at the end of the driveway out there. Sometimes there's somebody would be there to check if you needed a ride, and if it wasn't, you were on your own down the road to Chilaco. Mm -hmm. And I came here and I signed up and I started out being, I came here to be a baker. Okay. And uh, right across the street over there on the side of the building was a little uh, place about the size of this room, maybe a little bigger, that was the bakery. So I worked in the bakery until the horse farm burned down and I was helping move uh, a hose off of the lake toward the horse barn. And there was four or five of us had a hold this big hose. And we were stretching it out and taking the curves out of it. They turned it loose and I still had it, so I jerked my back and I had to, I had to quit over here because I couldn't lift anything on account of back sprain. Mm. So I went into shoe repair and leather craft. Didn't know anything about either one of them, but they had a good instructor here by the name of Megs. And he taught me all I knew about shoe repair and rather craft. And in two years, I made two pair of boots, one for the superintendent and one for myself, plus belts and belt folds and all of that stuff. I went to school. I went to school half a day in the morning you worked in the evening, you worked in the next morning, half a day and went to school in the afternoon. So you got a full day of school every other day, same way it was working. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was here until uh, 51, and I graduated in the spring of 51. And uh, that was, my end, well, in like 50 when the war broke out in Korea, mm -hmm. then I got my call. The minute I was in school, they gave me a deferment. So when I got out, I knew that was coming because when you get out, they turned loose, they let them know he's out of school now and all that. And you know, so I go back to Albert and I work the uh, wheat harvest again in the summertime of 51. Mm -hmm. And when I come back from wheat harvest, in a couple of weeks, my orders came through. I go to Oklahoma City. They got to check us all in, and they said, we're going to take out of the group here, there's a percentage of you are going to go in the Marine Corps. The rest of you are going to go in the Army. So I say to this Indian boy, full blood Indian boy with me. And uh, I said, let's go join the Marine Corps. And he said, oh, no, no, no. 
He said, I'm going to wait and see if I pass this. And I said, okay. And the next day, he flunked the thing and they sent him home. But I'd already gone and signed up oh. for Marine Corps. So that day, they called us out and they sent this guy over to that side of the room. They called my name, go over to that side of the room. Called another guy's name over here. Called another guy's name. So it was four out of like 60 guys, much basically that was in that group that was in the Marine Corps. The first guy was from Altus, Oklahoma, which was 30 miles from Hobart. He and I had both volunteered. He had his first year of college and they called him. So he volunteered. So I volunteered. Mm -hmm. The third guy said they brought him from, uh, he was in the defense plan up in Ohio, so he had to come back to Oklahoma. So he said, I got two years to do. If they tell me to stand in the corner of my head, I can do that for two years, that's no problem. The fourth guy hated the Marine Corps. Hated it with a passion. I've never seen anybody hate anything so bad. We go through MCRD, we get out, everything. And uh, my friend, he goes to Santa Ana, Marine Air Station. They sent me and these other two guys, we went to uh, uh, training at Camp Pendleton. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you call boondock training out and find out and winter training and all that. There was a guy that uh, wanted to go, said, I'll go, to four, uh, go on my head, sign on my head. They sent him to Pensacola, Florida, Marine Air Base, or, I mean, Marine Barracks as a guard duty at Pensacola. Mm -hmm. The fourth guy, he runs the phone ship going west, and I don't know whatever happened to him, but he was the only one out of the four of us that hated it so bad. So he hated it with a passion. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whatever happened to him. I hope that he made it, but with his attitude, you know, his, he was unlikely. Yeah. So. I waited and they shipped us all that to San Francisco for overseas. And I don't know where I'm going. I have no orders except to go with the group to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And uh, got there and everybody shipped out two or three every day or two was going and going. And one day, about a week later, I'm the only one out. My group was still in the barracks and just waiting. But I had a I had a cousin that lived in Oakland, so I went and visited them one weekend. I came back and the next day or so, I got my orders to leave. I asked the, the uh, sergeant where I was going, he said, I don't know, I had paperwork says put you on the ship. Mm. I said, okay, and you, know, I, you don't know anymore, I don't know. And when I got on the ship, I found out I was going to Pearl Harbor. Fleet Marine Force Pacific, Pearl Harbor, mm -hmm. and that was a small headquarters and service company for everything that paperwork that came out of the Far East came through Pearl before it came to the United States. So I just I worked in the warehouse there, whatever you know that company needed. It was a small company. We only had maybe a, maybe a hundred guys total. And so I was there for the remainder of my time. So you were there until 53? Got out in 53, got married in 53, in July of 53. Married a girl from Hawaii. Oh yeah? These girls that's doing the bingo out here, that's my daughters. Oh nice. My wife was out there too. Sure. That's uh, another story, we won't talk about that one. Uh, but anyhow, uh, we, uh, I worked with a, with a guy uh, at a service station down in Wagner He was still in the Navy and I was a civilian. And he said I was trying to get into a mechanic school. And uh, he, said, uh, he said, I'm going to go to the school in Kansas City. And he was from Missouri to start with. Right. And he was married, he was fine with his wife and baby was with him out there. 
So he said, we just come over to our house and have the Navy pick every your stuff up and mine too. Well, we're both Navy and Marine Corps. So they just went by and picked his stuff, stopped my house, picked all the stuff up that I needed shipped, shipped it to Missouri. And we came back here, we went to Kansas City. Mm -hmm. We went to school together, we lived together for a while. I lived with him and his family mm -hmm. until my family came. Uh, my wife and uh, little boy, they didn't come for about a month after I did. Mm -hmm. So I was all, I had to come here to get into school by, by the 1st of September. So I brought my daughter, my oldest daughter was 10 months old. And I brought her from Hawaii. You came with her without with, mom with, and brother? Without my wife and my oldest son. See, my wife fixed everything up that needed. Flew out from there to L.A., caught the train in L.A., rode the train to Newton, changed trains in Newton, rode that one south, got off to Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. We were like an Edwin. I put her last clean dress and her last clean diaper on her. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and we were on the train and flying from, uh, we left Hawaii Wednesday night, I believe. Mm -hmm. and then Thursday, we caught the train in LA. And we were on that all the way to the train broke up in Roswell and part of it come north, the rest of it went south to uh, Houston area. So we came that way, and I took everything, everything needed to be done. But in the trip from, from we got to L.A., my wife said, when you get there, you know, stop and get a couple of cans of milk. You can make the formula because they have hot water on the train or the cook can make it for you. I mean, she knew nothing about the train, but that's a, a, a here and there, and that's a story we that's what you did, worked yeah. up with. So the first day she ran out of formula, I went and the, got the cook to fix one. He opened the cans and the milk was no good. So I went back and got the other can of milk. He opened it and it was no good. Now here we're out this side of L.A. with a baby that needs formula. Yeah. That was on a milk formula. Yeah. I got off at every step, stop, from there to Roswell, New Mexico. Every time we pull in some place to stop, I would get off at the first of the train, run through the station to see if they had anything out and catch the last car as they were pulling out. Oh my gosh. And had this black lady on there, had a couple of youngsters, and she was bringing her husband's body home from, from California to Arkansas. And uh, I got talking to her after we got uh, to change trains at Newton, and she said, oh, I was hoping you always made that train. She said, because they were sitting in the same car that I was in, yeah. and there was a young lady sitting in front of me, and so I said, you watch my daughter. I'm going to go up to the front, get off, go through the station, and catch the train, catch a car before the train pulls out. So I did that until I got to Roswell, and we, we had to get off at Roswell because the air conditioning went out and they had to fix it. So they let everybody get off the train and go wandering for a couple of hours. So I went to the grocery store and got new milk, went back. The cook made it all up. So it's a good formula the rest of the way home. But, I had, but the days that, the one day, I just had the cook put red, uh, regular milk in and add water to it. and. It was fine, didn't bother her at all. So. How stressful. <laughs> we and my family met me in Oklahoma City, picked me up in Oklahoma City. And with the aid of them, 
my folks said. Your uncle, yeah, your... My mother and father and my sister. I see. Came to pick us up there. And she was, like I say, 10 months old. How stressful. No, no problem. No. Got on the plane at night and back in those days. And he flew the old uh, 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 Pan American flights out of the Pacific. And on the bulkhead, they had a place there and they had what they called a sky, sky cradle. They put it up there, they unscrewed it up, you put your baby in there, you had the first seat. So you were right there with your baby. Slip all night long, got on the plane about nine o'clock, quiet time. Got in the LA around seven o'clock for the next morning. Slip right through, no problem. And she didn't give me any problem on the train. And she lives in Florida. Uh, so, uh, that's amazing. It's, yeah. And then my wife and my son, they came a month later. They did basically the same thing. And then, but we picked them up at Paul's Valley mm -hmm. rather than Oklahoma City and decided, you know, I didn't know Oklahoma City was the only place I could think I could go on the train. But Paul's Valley is only 30 miles from Ada then. So, when, she came, when they came in, then my nephew and his friend took me and we went over and picked them up at the train station. Mm -hmm. And then they stayed with my parents for, I don't know, six weeks or something after I come up here and, uh, to Kansas City and started school. Mm -hmm. and then I went back and got them and they, they got a place to live and all of that. And then they came to Kansas City, and she loves Kansas City area. Always has loved Kansas City. Mm -hmm. So we just stayed in Kansas City, people say, your folks all live in Oklahoma, how come you stay in Kansas City? I said, well, sometime along the way, I said, if I live in Kansas City and something happens to my parents, Something. I can get home, and back in those days, it was a 10-hour drive. I can drive to Oklahoma in 10 hours. I'm far enough away that nobody knows what my business is, yet I keep in touch with everybody and tell them, come on, what we do is we stay in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. What they do, they do stay in Oklahoma, mm -hmm. so we don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. We did the best we can, and that's basically uh, what we did yeah. there. I went to uh, automotive and, and partially through diesel school, and... Uh, what made you decide to do that? Well, I was mechanicking basically when I was young. Uh, my brother and I took the family car that they didn't want back and then they got something else back. This is back in the middle 40s. Mm -hmm. And so we used to keep it up and going all the time. And, and it always ran like a clock all the time mm -hmm. because he and I both were, you know, shade tree mechanics that could make everything work. Yeah. And so uh, we just lived there and then they moved back to Oklahoma and uh, back to Ada area. And we stayed out there because he was working and then I got a job working there. Down at Hobart? And, yeah, Hobart. And uh, so we just stayed in that area until mm -hmm. it made the circle around and came back, got to Kansas City. Yeah. And uh, then well, I, I think it's interesting that you had this affinity for mechanics, but that's not what you chose to do in Shilako, and it's maybe no, not what you I, did in the military. I, I left uh, the uh, shoe repair and leather craft company completely, except for a little bit of hobby work yeah. on leather craft. Was there an option for you to do auto mechanics or anything like that at Shilako at that time? There was there was an automotive place, but I, I, I wasn't interested in going over there. 
How come? And I don't know. Uh, I had never known. They was probably somebody I knew that was in shoe repair and leather craft. And I had met the instructor. And so that's just where I went. I see. What about baking? Because you had said you went there thinking I, you were going to do yeah, baking. Uh, I, I've never missed a meal for myself. <laughs> Is that just something you thought you wanted to learn, or did you think maybe I uh, would be a baker? Well, a friend of mine that I was in high school with, at Obert, uh, he had graduated, and then he got a job delivering bread. Mm -hmm. So when I wasn't doing anything, I'd hop on the truck with him and make his route during the day. And finally decided, you know, that's probably something I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause I wasn't afraid of it. I wasn't afraid that I couldn't do it. It felt so. It felt like I could, you know, do that kind of work. And uh, so that's why I wound up thinking I was going to do when I came here. I see. And uh, then when I got hurt and I couldn't pick up anything, I couldn't lean over that much. And that was kind of the second shot of getting my back hurt. Mm. And but I passed the Marine Corps with no problem. They yeah. had they had to help me a lot of times out on marches and everything. Two three times I'd never made it. I'd been for a couple of good buddies. They help you they get to the end. Help me make the rest of the trip trip come back. Uh, we had a guy that we had a guy when we was in training, and uh, he uh, he had decided, I guess, somewhere along the line, he was not going to stay in the Marine Corps. Now I didn't know him that well. He was he was a person that uh, that uh, had a mental condition at that point. He was like second from the back on the, when you were marching. He'd just step out and call his dog. Run along and call his dog coming and there was no dog out there. And they'd go for about four, five, six steps and he'd get back in line again. And the DIs would talk to him and tell him, you gotta stay in there buddy and do all this. It was the same thing over and over and over and over. And one day they just told him to pack his stuff and they sent him to the hospital at the main side. And that, was during, that was during boot camp? And, and he went, I guess they sent him to the uh, 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 psychiatric ward to find out what his problem was. I never did see or hear anything from him. But it takes a lot of guts, even if you're good up here, to do something like that. Yeah. Do you it, think it was genuine? Do you think he generally had something wrong? Yeah. I, I mean, there, I think everybody thought that he definitely had a mental problem, mm -hmm. and how he ever passed. Well, when they when they were picking you up to draft you, as long as you could walk and talk and and you didn't have anything really bad, they passed you on down the line. Mm -hmm. Some of it they passed you down the line and let wherever you went, take care of it. Yeah, I see. See, it's easier sometimes when we got thousands of guys coming through all the time yeah. to read whatever's down and yeah. send them some other place to let somebody else. So you went to Camp Pendleton for boot camp? Yeah, no, that was uh, what they call tent camp. That was to get you acclimated to working in the uh, Outside. How'd you acclimate? Well, just they they marched you. They give you a rifle. They no, I mean, you. how did you do? Was was it hard for you, or was it? Oh, was it, was, it was hard for me, but I made it. The only thing I couldn't really handle it was the long marches. That was the worst thing. And that was from your back. And yeah, and then we went to winter training. Uh, up uh, by uh, Reno, Nevada, mm -hmm. up in. Uh, in the mountains in uh, like February, last of January or February, 
and the snow was about this deep. Mm -hmm. And we got out there and it was snowing when we got there. So we had a week's snow training. Mm -hmm. And you would march all day mm -hmm. through this snow. You had to make your own trip and stay in somebody else's trail and go so wherever that the old officer wanted you to go to and then set up camp. And then about that time you got warm, here would come a whole group of guys that worked at the camp all the time. Mm. They, they were the enemy. They would come down over the hills and skis and right through your camp and shooting blank cartridges or throwing uh, 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 firecrackers and all that stuff to get you up, to get you acclimated that you might have to go to this because if you were going to Korea, it was there already. Mm -hmm. So they tried to get you all situated so that you would know what you were expected to do and you'd grab your clothes as best you could and get them on and grab your life rifle and get outside to see what was going on, you know. Yeah. But they had a, they had a what they call a warm tent. If you just couldn't stay in your own you had a buddy, you had two shelter halves, you put those together and you made a tent out of it. And you had two sleeping bags that went in there. Mm -hmm. But I tell you something, if you ever go out know, overnight anywhere, if you, can, you get something to go between your uh, sleeping bag and Mother Earth, as the sergeant said, I don't care how much you love her, you'll never warm her up. <laughs> you'll never warm her up. Anything. Well, when, when, when they would deliver supplies out in the field, we'd grab a, in, any piece of uh, cardboard box we could get. If it's only this big, and it goes under the same part of your, your sleeping bag, then your heat don't go to the ground. It goes there and reflects back in, into your bag or under your bag. Mm -hmm. And and you, you don't freeze to death, but if you're on the ground, you freeze to death. Mm -hmm. And you never get warm. You could put anything under it, put a shelter raft under it, put anything between you and the ground. Yeah. And and it's the same thing like going out and, you know, people go hiking and everything now. They, they never think about what they need to take. A, a rolled up piece of plastic, a, a, a black plastic bag is better than anything else you can get. It doesn't take up any room. It spreads out. It keeps the cold in Mother Earth mm -hmm. when you're laying down like that. So that so was something that they taught you when they you first got there? You Taught you all you could do, something to take the cold off of you. Because mm -hmm. when you get out in the cold weather, it's cold, cold, cold. That's why I love hot weather. I've always been able to take enough clothes off to be decent and still <laughs> to be cool. Wintertime, you can't, you can't put on enough clothes to stay warm all the time. Mm -hmm. It's just cold and cold, and that's what killed most of the guys in Korea, was they froze to death. So did you have expectations you would be sent to Korea at that time? When you're in the Marine Corps, you, you have a number they give you. It's 0300. That means you're a rifleman. You're in ordnance somewhere or other. If you're working in a warehouse, they give you a number, 0311 or 110 or 112, depending on your rank, depending on what kind of job you're going to do. But everything is 0300, and that means if the order comes out, 0300, I don't care how good a baker you are or what you're doing, you drop that and get your rifle and go you go to the front line. 
so they do, there's no, when it gets down to the real nitty gritty, mm -hmm. the only people that stay back is the people that are support back mm -hmm. behind the front line people. Mm -hmm. so that's, that's, that's the way they work. If all the half of them drop out, they bring some more of these people up to take take over. So you, no matter what you are, no matter how high you go, you're a rifleman. You're supposed to know how to use that, get out there, do the best you know how to do. Mm. But I had some friends that was in the army, and well. The Marines got the same thing. They fought their way all the way up to the Chosin Reservoir. And then they turned around and fought their way back. It was so cold. Guys told me that was in the Army that I worked with played years later. He said, we never turned a, a, a vehicle off. It ran day and night. And to keep warm, we had to cut out a top out of a barrel, put some holes in it, we pour oil in it, keep that oil going, and that's how you got heat at night. Mm -hmm. was, that was the only heat you had. Mm -hmm. But he said a lot of guys would be fighting, they would be, I mean, they wouldn't fight, and they were fighting the weather mm -hmm. during the days. And they would, lay, they would lay down at night or get in the truck at night couldn't get warm enough and then they froze to death. So a lot of them died, never never got hit. They died from exposure. And the, the Marines turned around and they were fighting back down the southern way. And some reporter said, Joe, how come you your reversed your uh oh you were going north. How come you reversed, started backing up? And he said, we're not backing up, we're fighting our way out. See that? Nobody will admit to it, but 90% of the, I wouldn't say 90%, 50% of the, of the enemy was Chinese. They weren't, they weren't all Korean. China. Mm -hmm. We did a, did in a lot of Chinese people that they won't admit that they that they were there, but the Chinese were there. Was that commonly something that was yeah. known? Yeah, it's just the, common knowledge yeah. that it was there. And about time you get someplace bivouac for the night, then here would come a group of them. They might not even be a rifle in their group but they had pots and pans and everything they could make noise with. Mm -hmm. And all at once, noise would break out. And here you got to get out of bed and see what's going on and all of that. And then you were firing and they found a lot of people that they, enemy that they killed that there wasn't a rifle in a bunch. Mm -hmm. they, were, they, were, they were psychologically trying to beat the Americans, because they would over instead of fighting all day, they may be resting all day somewhere, just a few people fighting. Mm -hmm. But at night, they would come out where there was a lot of them, and they would make noise. They would make music come some kind, blow horns, uh, anything to keep you awake. Were you ever over in Korea? No. So, but I had some friends. I was going to say I had a lot of friends that, that was there. Uh, and mostly was Army friends that I met when I came back, mm -hmm. when I came back to the States. Mm -hmm. It's the guys that had been there and uh, had come home, got discharged or whatever, and they'd say, yeah, you know, this happened, that yeah. happened. And, uh, and, and most you? of them had uh, uh, the uh, uh, PTSD. Yeah. They didn't know what it was back then. Mm -hmm. But now I know what it is, basically. And I have two son, two grandsons of my family. Uh, didn't have anybody. Uh, I had an uncle that was World War I that I know of. 
I don't know of any of the May family that was in World War II. There must have been some of them somewhere, of the May and the Gibson family, but I don't know of any close friends that was there. Right. Then I was in the Marine Corps. My, my brother graduated from here. He, the three years he was here, he was in the National Guard. In Chilocco. Yeah. yeah. And then when he got out of here, he went to Barberville and he was working there in shoe repair and leather care. That's the kind of line of work. And he couldn't get to a place wherever the meeting was at because he didn't have a car at that point. He was straight out of school. So finally he signed out of the National Guard. Mm -hmm. And my mother said to the draft board, uh, uh, my son just got out of the National Guard. Do you think there's ever a chance of him being called up? And the guy said, I don't know. Sixty days later, he had his draft notice. And he was been three years here out, a couple of years, more or less, gotten married, had a job, and he got his call. So he he went in. What did he go? Went in the army. Army. Yeah, because he was in the National Guard. Here, so he went in the army, and he'd always been good with a rifle or a pistol. So when he got in the army, and he went through all the training, and they were looking for people that was marksmen to go around and teach people give demonstrations. So they sent him and his wife to Germany, was their headquarters, and they traveled all over, he traveled all over Europe doing demonstrations. Mm -hmm. So he didn't have a hard time, but he was at a, like the Cold War type, he was in that area there where there wasn't any fighting going on, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah. So he did his time and, and got out. So he was in, I had a nephew that was in the National Guard at Ada, mm -hmm. and he went to Louisiana. He was there. My, my daughter that I brought from Hawaii, when she grew up in 1970, and along about 19, middle 1970s, she joined the Air Force. Mm -hmm. She went, there was an Air Force base right outside Kansas City. So she went into the nursing side of the Air Force. Mm -hmm. So she went out there for meetings and meetings, and then they sent her down here to uh, Wichita Falls, and she took all of her training at Wichita Falls. And then when they got all through with that, nothing was going on, so they took her out, mm -hmm. let her go. Yeah. So then she was in. Then nobody else was in out of my family until my two grandsons grew up. Mm -hmm. And they were from my youngest brother. Mm -hmm. The youngest one, he's got a little bit of smarts up there. Mm -hmm. When he was in high school, he joined the National Guard. Summertime, he'd go to camp. Winter, he'd go to school. Summertime. He did like that about three years. His brother was going and he graduated and then he didn't have a job. So he was just doing one thing or another. And he, my family was working in the, the uh, 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 doing landscape work and all that kind of thing, okay. you know, yep. uh, around the new buildings and all that. Yeah. So he got a job, he took a job following the lawnmower for one of the companies, cutting grass that had to be cut wherever they were, had buildings he wanted everything. He said one day, I can't handle this, so he went and joined the Army, joined the regular Army. Mm -hmm. 
Well, his brother is younger than him, and he's gone to school, uh, gone to the army three years, mm -hmm. and he's already got rank on him. They both wound up going through uh, the uh, camp over in uh, in Missouri, and uh, the the oldest one got married, had one little child, and uh, this was like his second year second year in, uh, in service, I guess. And then uh, the Haiti deal the, came off. So he was in a group that went to Haiti and spent nearly a year. Then he comes back home and he goes back to camp again. And then one day they called that bunch up and gave them the final whatever they needed to do because they were gonna go to Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. He shipped out the 1st of December. The youngest one ships out the 1st of January. They both went to Afghanistan. Same time, same basic time. The youngest one went down to South Afghanistan. The oldest one went to Leatherneck up in the north. So his second child is coming along. Sergeant said, May, I can't send you home to be with your wife, but uh, I'm going to send you down south to be with your brother. Mm. So we transferred him for a weekend. For one weekend? For one weekend. Yeah. They were there nine months. They saw each other three times. Oh, gosh. And the youngest one came home first. He was the last to go over and come home first. The older one came home the next time, and the oldest one is uh, at Fort Riley now, mm -hmm. and the youngest one works for a gas service company in Kansas, mm -hmm. Kansas City. But they've both been to Afghanistan, yeah. and he had uh, the PTSD when he came home. He was, he, he knew he did, he felt it, he, and they brought him in to Fort Riley and then they shipped him all the way down here to Texas and gave him his discharge down there. He's 40 miles from home yeah. up there and he couldn't get them to sign the papers. He had to go down here. They brought them all down to Texas, cut them loose, then sent them home. Yeah. And he went to the hospital down there when he was there for, I don't know, a week or two, whatever, and kept telling them, you know, I need some help, I need some help. And they said, go, when you get home, go see somebody up there that can help you at the base or whatever. Like I told you before, they push stuff off sometime, don't handle it. The same way with the, with the, the VA, the whole deal of the VA. I never, I've never spent one day or night or one hour in the VA hospital. Everything that I have medical done, I have paid for it. I've had insurance that I paid for it. And I never went. I had friends that went and got good service in some of them. Yeah. But this was so back in the 60s. Was this a choice of yours not to go to the VA then? Huh? You chose not to go to the VA? Yeah. You I, mean, I, I, would, I, I don't think I would go to the VA. Somebody might take me there. But I won't think I'd go there on my own. Why is that? I just don't I'll trust them. Mm -hmm. With all of the things that's gone on with the VA, which was supposed to be a great thing, and it was to start with, but it got so big. People don't understand that every year everything gets bigger and bigger. But this back here doesn't get smaller and smaller all the time mm -hmm. for until it gets way down the line, yeah. you know, 20 or 30 years down the line before these people get the point they can't do anything. Yeah. And yet they got people that's coming out all the time that needs help. Right. It, uh, well, it's obvious that you have a long history of, of military service in your family. I, yeah, I have, yeah, I, I have a service. I know what goes on with some of them. And, uh, 
my my youngest uh, grandson when they were in Afghanistan, uh, Afghanistan they lived in a place mm -hmm. camp. Mm -hmm. They'd go out on patrol during the day and they'd come back to camp at night because they had these uh, uh, freight uh, crates mm -hmm. that they shipped stuff in. That's what they made their barracks out of. Right. Pretty well protected, you know. So they would go out and they would go out and he was kind of uh, I don't know what his rank was, but uh, he was like second or third charge of a group that was going out. So he said to the guy one day, why do we go out the same gate every day? Yeah. There's four gates on this base. Why do we go out the same gate? Those people are watching us. They, they know exactly how many people they'd go out that gate every day. Somebody's sitting up in the mountains, we hold right there somewhere, counting us. From now on, I suggest that we go out on a different gate every day. No matter where we're going, and if we have to go all the way around the camp and come back and do the same. So they're out walking down the road, looking for uh, IUDs. Yep. And he stepped. And he, the ground under his foot was soft, and he didn't move. And he called the sergeant, and he said, he said, what's wrong? And he said, I don't know, but underneath my foot, it's soft. And that's what these people do. They go alongside of the road, dig out a spot, put a charge there, and cover it all up. And so uh, he said, uh, well, let's just stop and figure this out, what we're gonna do. And they're finally well, gonna get you off of that thing. So they go get a rope, about 30, 40 foot of rope, tied around him, tied to the Jeep, which is back on good ground. And he told his he told his sergeant, he said, tell him full trouble of them. Mm -hmm. He said, don't worry out. Mm -hmm. They jerked him off of that, and that's how they got that's how they saved the guys. Mm -hmm. If they knew if they thought they were on something that was gonna blow up, yeah. they could tie something to them and jerk them off and not blow up right on them. Come to find out. Somebody had dug a hole, they couldn't get it deep enough, and they covered it back up. Mm -hmm. And that's the one he stepped on. Mm -hmm. But he said, you know, I figured my days were. Yeah. Well, this, so I, just listening to this guy's talk yeah, well, over the years. Also, when you, were, when you were stationed at Pearl Harbor, I mean, that's a big thoroughfare. So yeah, it seems like even with that, you everything that came in and out of Pearl, you know, we go up every day and check the roster of casualties to see if we knew anybody mm -hmm. that was on the casualty list that had been. Because when I went into that barracks, there was 80 guys in it. I come in from that Catlin one evening, and it was a, a, a deal on the board. Yeah. Next morning, there was 20 of us left. There was 60 of them left that morning. Gone what? So how did you feel? I mean, it, 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 you were there. You were. You knew your job was to stay there every no, day. Did no. you not? I knew my job was there every day. When I got up, that's where they told me to go. Oh, so you but didn't it know could, it was a... It, it, it could have evaporated during the day. They could call me, and when they, when all these people left, I could have been one of them that left rather than one that stayed there. So they didn't. It's just who they need somewhere mm -hmm. else, and you're holding down something back here that is minimum number of people that can handle this back here. Yeah. So. Uh, the warehousing had uh, 
uh, master sergeant, a staff sergeant, uh, corporal, uh, I think and I had one guy, I think we had two corporals and one PSC. Mm. There were five warehouses moving in and out of Pearl every day. Yeah. So we didn't, we'd get up in the morning, take a truck, go out to Kaplan, which is between Pearl and Honolulu, about five miles. Mm. And that's where we, that was where our duty station was all during the day unless unless we were called in to do something else. Mm. And in uh, uh, December 1952, there's a sign on a bulletin board that says, everybody will not do your jobs today. They all fall out over by the warehouse. So we went over there and they said, Okay, go back to your barracks, put on your Class A uniform, and you're going to go over to Kanyoe, which mm -hmm. was a Marine Air Base. Mm -hmm. And they're going to take how many men there was, I don't know how many was in that unit at that time. So we go over there, and we have a, we have a uh, Staff Sergeant that was in charge, I think. So we get there, and he meets somebody from County Hoy, and they said, oh yeah, we got these four bungalows over here. We have to put guards around them. The president-elect, Eisenhower, will be in about four o'clock in the afternoon. He's been, he's won the election, He's gone to Japan to converse with the people in the field. He's coming back here. He's gonna spend four days here before he goes back to the States. Mm -hmm. He'll be back there for Christmas time, and then he will be inaugurated in January. So I stood front door guard on Eisenhower when he was, before he took office. It was like this, the front door was walkway. The door was here. This was the back of the wall going to the bedroom. I stood in that corner from noon to four o'clock. Mm -hmm. They came about three or three thirty, they got in, they came to the bungalow. I opened the door, I saluted him, and he went in. And that's the first and last time I ever saw him, except when he came out to go home on Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and so we, we, had, we had guys that walked along the beach. Right. There wasn't anything between the Kanyoa Beach and Alaska or Washington, or Oregon or somewhere, there was nothing out there. But you had to have somebody out there walking. So these guys that walked down here, they walked to the center and back and forth like this. On, on these all, all day and all night. My first day was in the afternoon, four hours in the afternoon. When I got off of there, I didn't have a dry thread on me. Mm -hmm. The polish on my shoes had melted off. And it was only about 80 degrees, but that sun is just burning down. You had to be there. You didn't have any place to go. Mm -hmm. The next time I came on, the Secret Service man that was with them, they were 12 hours, 12 hours. So the guy, when the next time I came on, this guy was on there. And uh, on each in each corner of the bungalow was a great big floodlight mm -hmm. shining out. You couldn't see you couldn't see the bungalows when you were out there looking this way. Right. He said, "Go get you a chair. Come around here, sit with me, right at this corner. We were just around the corner from the main street. 
but we see everything that's on the street. We see everything down there, and he was from Oklahoma too. And he talked and he said, yeah, I said, I got a job, Secret Service. And he said, some days it's hard work. It was 12 hours and 12 hours. And he said, that really gets monotonous and sometimes it gets awful hard. But he said, you know, it's a job. I like it because I travel a lot, a lot too. And we sat back there I, on, the, on the days that I came at night Mm -hmm. And he was on. Then we sat in the shadows. And he said, my buddies are all out here walking mm -hmm. the beats back there. But that, that's, that's my highlight, I guess, is opening and closing the door. I heard some bad language that they did during the night. Oh, from inside? The yeah, from inside. Uh, where Eisenhower was? From Eisenhower. And it's the same thing then as it is now. The reporters would not leave the president alone. They asked the stupidest questions that anybody can think of. And he, and he walks five minutes, five steps over here and somebody asked him the same question. And he blew up in there that night with whoever his guy that was, uh, uh, It wasn't vice president, it was somebody else, you know, mm -hmm. in, in, in his cabinet that was with him. And they were talking, and the, the windows were open, they had fans going. The windows were open, it was nice and cool, you know. Mm -hmm. And I'm standing outside here, and I can hear them talking. And he was so mad. He was so, oh, he was, they were, and this guy was saying, Mr. President, they're all this way. You didn't know that. You've never been in a position in your adult life of being in the military. You have never been in a position like this where you can't say anything back to them. In the military, you could work it around and tell that man over there to go somewhere else. But you can't tell that civilian out here that's asking all these stupid questions. He said, yeah, but I answered it once, and they said, yeah, and you'll answer it again and again unless you just, when you finally turn them off, then they'll write something else about you. They'll have another question to ask you next week or next tomorrow when they see you. And he said, he said, they're that way. They just get worse sometimes. So you can hear that through the open oh, window? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, that. I'm, you know, from here to the wall, from where they were at in the living room, mm -hmm. and I'm standing outside of the door, and it was just a screen door. Isn't that interesting? So, uh, but I've never been to the museum, and it's not that far from where I live. I just never get there. The Korean yeah. War? No, the, which the Eisenhower. Oh, the Eisenhower yeah. Museum, sorry. Yeah, so, they're, they're about 150 miles, basically, or less. Yeah. From where I live, uh, and but I, I've, I've never traveled. I've never been able to afford to travel, like I would have liked to have traveled. Mm -hmm. I, I never did go down to Lake of the Ozarks until a couple of years ago, and there's hundreds of thousands of acres of of lakes mm -hmm. down in there, but it just never was a point that. If I had time off, I usually came to Oklahoma to see my yeah. papers, you know, yeah. stuff like that, that I felt like was more important than right. going out. But I know people that can't live from Monday to Friday to go to the lake, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you probably see them going over to Grand Lake the same way or oh, yeah. some of the other places. Yeah. We got some lakes for them, Matt. Yeah. Well, can you? We've been talking for an hour now, so yeah. I'm not going to keep you too much longer because I know lunch is happening. I can hear it, and I know um, that's it's been a long day. Um, but I'm just curious at this point. I, I it, it really has actually been been interesting. I know when you started, you said, "Uh, I just you know, there's nothing really to tell, right?" But it's been interesting even to hear about how you've 
who you met and who you, where how you negotiated being in Pearl Harbor. Um, is there anything I, I missed about that that part of your service era that you want to talk about before well, we wrap up? Uh, you know, uh, the the guy that I that I went in that I volunteered with. Yeah. I come in from my, my workstation one day, about a month after I got there, and I have a phone call in the office, and the guy said, somebody called for you, and I said, I don't know anybody out here, and they said, well, somebody called, and they left this number to, for you to call. So I called, and it was a guy that I had volunteered with. They had sent him over from uh, Santa Ana, they sent him to the, to the Marine Air Station at County LA. Oh. So he called me. Then we were friends there. All the time we were there, he was, best, he was one of the ushers at my wedding and all that. I had a military style of wedding with all the guys in uh, uh, Marine dress Aww. uniform. Nice. And, uh, so, uh, I mean, all the guys came and they, they hunted up with uniforms and wore. We used to say the uniform of the day in Hawaii is dress blues, tennis shoes, and the lower shirts. <laughs> Nobody ever dressed that way, but that's all they all have to do. You uh, wish. But you know, when I, I guess maybe when I came here, they probably instilled something in me that uh, that I was already doing for the people that I met here encouraged me to do to stay with whatever I felt like I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I had, I, you know, I had, I had, I, I, we've had a good life, really. I mean. Uh, I, I've had a lot of sickness in the last 10 years. I had hay fever for 25 or 30 years. Bad. But I worked almost every day. Uh, I worked for, uh, I wound up uh, working for the city of Kansas City, Missouri Park and Recreation Department mm. in a small engine type of work, a mile more. Mm. Right. Stuff like that, and then I graduated to the trucks and what have you. That, and then I wound up uh, doing uh, uh, welding work because I had done welding work before I even went to college. I went to school. Mm -hmm. I did welding work at uh, I helped build a stadium at uh, uh, at Hobart, a concrete stadium, and on the the year before I went to went to Chilaco. Mm -hmm. So I knew something about welding, but I didn't take it up there. It just lingered along over the years, and then finally when I worked for the park department, it was a job that I went to. I had a pretty good job, but they decided they were going to cut my wages, and I said, I can't handle that. Mm -hmm. I've got a family to feed. i got to find something that, uh, that I can still make a living at. Yeah. I, it's not that I don't think I can. So I was just off for a while and then I found a job with the city and it didn't pay a lot of money to start with, but it paid a lot more money than what I was making. Mm -hmm. It's the last job I had. Okay. And then I got the insurance, then I got sick leave, then I got vacation time. Mm -hmm. And I saved as much as I could, but when I was sick, that was covered uh, along the way. Right. And I worked there, I worked for the Park Department 24 and a half years. And when I got to be 60, with the, the uh, time and job that I had with them, mm -hmm. and my age, mm -hmm. you had to be 80 before you could retire with full pension from the city. Right. So I had like 84 years mm -hmm. at that point. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, maybe I'll just retire yeah. and do what I want to do and what have you. And I, I was renting a little farm out in South Kansas City. I raised horses. I had 
I had 25 horses at one time. <laughs> oh, that's a lot, yeah. <laughs> I mean, this was just horses, and I had six or eight horses that boarded with me. Yeah. And uh, I got up and I fed them and I did and I went to work and I did all that stuff for uh, seven or eight years yeah. before I retired. And then when I retired, I took care of them and, and yeah. uh, that kind of thing. Yeah. But I've been retired since 89. Oh gosh, that is a long time. <laughs> it's longer than I worked. Oh my gosh, that is a long time. But like I say, the pay wasn't that good Yeah. to start with. But you it had got a little better benefits. along the line. Yeah. It, uh, other things got better. Mm -hmm. It was enough to live on, you know, if you live right and right. whatever you can get by of the, uh, along the way. And uh, then uh, when I retired, then you can work so much when you retire if you want to retire. Right. And you can work a full-time job by working with your right. um, uh, yeah. retirement funds yeah. and all of that stuff. Uh, but I just fiddled here a little while and, and yeah. did one thing yeah. and another and kind of did what I wanted to. And then in 93, I wouldn't, I'd get up in the morning, go feed my horse and everything, go to work, and I'd get this hurting right up here on my shoulder. And it would last for maybe 10 minutes or so. So after a while, I went to see my doctor and she checked me all over. She said, I want you to go down to the hospital and get checked. Yeah. So I went down to the hospital and they checked me and they put the catheter in the, in the dye and whatever. Right, sure. And right here, I had a collapse on the coronary oh, artery gosh. right here. It was, right. They said, we, we don't know how long it's been that way. It could have been that way all your life. It could be the yeah. last years of it. Right. That uh, we can do two things. We can go in there and we can sure. check that out. Or we go in there and we open it up. And it might stay open and it may collapse again. And I said, well, doctor, why don't you go fix it then? It's okay, I'll do that. So they took the vein out of my leg and put a shuttle around the spot there. They didn't take that spot out. Mm -hmm. They just right, went around bypassed it. it. So I got yeah. more flow through that area than I ever had through that well, area. And here you are. That was oh, and, 25 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I just asked him, I said, how long is this good for? And he said, well, you know, nowadays we're talking about 15 years with no trouble, it's, that's what we. That's how long we've been doing it, and we yeah. know that it yeah, worked yeah. Right. at that point. And I've been in the hospital umpteen times, and they always they said go back every year or every two years and get a full check. Sure, on. right. They said your heart beats better and everything than they ever has. And a couple of guys uh, a few years ago said. Your heart's stronger now than most 25, 30 year olds are nowadays. Oh gosh. And I said, I've never had any. It's all that right living. All that right living you did up till that well, point, right? right now, I don't know what it was <laughs> okay. uh, uh, along the way. Uh, but I didn't. I had a horse fall on me when I was like 12 or 13. Oh no, that was your first back injury then? Yeah. Yeah. I fell, the horse fell. And I fell in a rut mm -hmm. on the mm -hmm. hillside going sure, to the pasture. Right, right, I right. fell on my back, and the horse fell and rolled over me. I see. And I didn't have anything broken. You know, got up, about staggered that. around a little bit, and went to the house. Told yeah. my mom the oh, horse gosh. fell on me. Well, you wasn't supposed to be riding a horse anyhow. I said, I know, but that. Those are hard. And, you know, well, I can hear them closing down down there. So I, I don't care if they close up. <laughs> but I but, this, this was interesting. Thanks for taking your time out of your afternoon. Hey, that uh, it's just another. Well, this is more important to me. 
Oh. Than that, because I see that every year, and I've been with that ever since. I've been coming to the things like uh, a year after the bombing at Oklahoma City. Right. I started coming for the alumni association. To the meeting. alumni association there. Lived in Kansas City, never sent a child of mine here. Oh, Had two girls and two boys, and never sent one down here. And I'll tell you something, I didn't know what I was doing or didn't remember.